Hi, this is Ned Siegfried from Siegfried & Jensen. As proud sponsors of BeliefCast, we hope you are inspired by Todd's weekly podcasts, which contain so many courageous stories of recovery and personal growth. Remember, it's not what happened in the past that matters, it's what happens in the future. We invite you all to work hard and be optimistic about your future. Enjoy today's podcast. Welcome back, everybody. This is Todd Sylvester with the Todd Inspires Belief Cast. Thank you once again for tuning in. You guys are fantastic. I can't express enough gratitude and love towards you guys. Um, we're helping so many people with this podcast and this belief cast because of you guys, because you're sharing it with so many people. And we have such amazing guests come on and they're vulnerable and they share amazing stories. So thank you for sharing. I need, I need to give a shout out to our sponsors, Siegfried and Jensen, Wasatch Recovery, um, I Hill Institute, Living Interventions Recovery, and Veracity Networks. Thank you so much for supporting this and also helping getting the word out. You guys, your belief in me just blows my mind. But you guys are in for a treat today. Today, uh, we we're joined by Roger and Ashley Bedsoul. Thank you so much, Roger and Ashley, for being here with us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. You bet. These two have such a, uh, an amazing story, but it's also very unique, too. Um, and we'll get into that. But uh, they are celebrating just over three years of being clean and sober. So congratulations, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah. So you guys, um, so Roger, a little background on Roger. He's a firefighter. He's been doing it for almost 30 years. Um, and Ashley's a stay home mom for almost 12 years. She, she homeschools her kids. I saw a very funny post that you put, uh, Ashley, you said, if you see my kids locked outside the home, don't, you know, stay out of my business. Uh, it's a fire drill, right? <laughs> yes. It was one of those days. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, but yeah, you guys, uh, you know, have, you have some amazing kids. Um, I know Ashley, you mentioned, uh, in your bio that you lost your dad back in 2020, kind of unexpectedly. Um, if you want, we can also talk about that, but more importantly, the thing that really stood out to me is you guys went to rehab together. <laughs> yeah, a little different. It, it, and that is different. And I like what you say, Ashley, a lot. There, there is no one way to this. It's uh, everyone gets to recovery or to be sober in a different way. And, you know, I respect all avenues. If you get there, what does it matter? Right. At the end of the day. So why don't we just turn the time over to you guys and maybe share your story with us and, you know, talk about how you guys maybe met. I know you guys are madly in love. It's, it's awesome to see how uh, tight you guys are. And uh, maybe talk about what led to you guys, you know, going into rehab together. Well, I, I guess I can kind of start with the how we met thing. Um, I, uh, the firefighter thing, I've actually been a fireman right at 20 years. Um, oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, oh, it's all right. I, I uh, started volunteering uh, back in like 2001, but I got hired on with our uh, city department here in town in 2005. And after being on about a year, I got moved kind of unexpectedly to a different station within the city, okay. which I wasn't very happy about, but uh, which yeah. nobody gets to get moved. <laughs> but uh, when I got moved, my new captain was her dad. And, oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. And, uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I didn't know her for a while. I mean, I think the first time we actually got face to face meeting um, was on a fire call uh they she was out with her mom and stopped by the fire right okay. as it was so you know i had to keep my bunker pants on and look as, as sexy as possible but <laughs> <laughs> well that was the first time you had seen her oh well i i had seen her kind of come in and out of the station but you know i never really paid a whole lot of attention and tried to keep my distance because obviously it's the captain's daughter <laughs> right. um, and uh you know at, when, when the fire call happened they showed up uh I couldn't hold it back anymore. I guess I had to go over there and at least speak, which he didn't seem too happy about, but, uh, Oh, oh really? Okay. It, he ended up pretty forgiving after a while, but yeah, we, uh, we, we started dating. It was really a, a while after the, after meeting, um, shoot, probably a year after that, I guess. Okay. And, uh, yeah, it kind of went from there. Um, we, we would tell her dad that, you know, we're, we're just friends, you know, there's nothing to worry about. We're not dating or anything like that, <laughs> but, uh, it, he was he wasn't stupid. He's a very smart guy. He knew what was going on. Was was he okay with it? Uh, yeah. 
<laughs> he acted like he wasn't, but part of me kind of thinks he was. Part of me kind of thinks that uh, he might have kind of set us up because me and him got real tight. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, we, we ended up more of like a like like really good friends instead of just captain and fireman. Um, oh, I, I hang out with him on days off and things like that, which was even better because I got to see her more. Oh, yeah, that is good. Yeah. You know, uh, he wasn't making you work like double time. Like, well, if you're going to be around my daughter, I'm going to work you extra hard. So, you know, keep you in shape and keep you in line. The, the funny <laughs> thing was uh, they ended up moving us from each other pretty quick at the fire department because they found out that I was dating his daughter. But, you know, the, the, what they didn't understand is that he was harder on me than anybody. Mm. Like, they were worried there'd be some favoritism there, but uh, there definitely wasn't. <laughs> yeah. He wanted to prove, hey, I'm going to be the opposite, right? Exactly. Uh, Oh, well, that's neat. What a, that, that's a cool story. How you guys met that way. And, um, that could have been touch or go, right. It could have gone either way, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> That's awesome. Well, so you guys obviously are, I mean, you know, this, I can tell you guys just love each other so much. You guys, um, you guys share the same sobriety date, which is really cool. Uh, November 18th of 2018. Is that correct? Yes. So I mean, I'm looking at you too. I mean, again, just like with any addiction, you know, you look at you too and you think, well, you guys look like you got everything. Everything looks great. You guys look, you're beautiful people. Like you don't seem like you guys would be drug addicts or, or, you know, have a struggle with that. So maybe talk about, you know, after you guys met, you know, you're together, what, what led to, you know, you guys, you know, becoming addicts and, and, and what that led to. We were, we were actually married for two years and had two uh, little boys before um, the whole addiction thing started. Um, and it was, it was an, it was an amazing life really. I mean, it was mm -hmm. a fairy tale to me. Um, and the addiction thing kind of started with him. So I guess I'll kind of, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. I can, I can tell that, I guess. Uh, like you said, we were married for a couple of years. Um, we had a couple boys. Uh, neither one of us came from hard families or bad families or anything like that. We we're both yeah. spoiled only children. No reason to really go into drugs or anything like sure, that. Yeah. Um, I had an operation on uh, my wisdom teeth that kind of didn't go as smoothly as it should have and ended up getting a prescription for Percocet mm. doing that, going through that. And, uh, you know, at the same time, I had been – at that time, I'd been around the fire department roughly 10 years by then, and uh, or a little less, I guess. And I was kind of having some issues with work also. Um, at that, by then, I'd seen some things that you know, you're not really too proud of, and yeah. don't that kind of stick with you a little bit. And the Percocet was like a magic drug. Uh, it helped me sleep better at night, kept my mind straight. Yeah. I wasn't hurting anymore. Um, I was a lot nicer to her and the boys all the time and yeah. it kind of became a habit from there which i in turn said hey uh you help try this out <laughs> like it's, it's it's making the day go by a whole lot easier for me so uh why don't you try it why don't you try it yeah I, I blame myself a lot for that yeah well so, and yeah and, and that uh you know it's unfortunate we hear that a lot where i mean you weren't seeking out to go be a drug addict or you know but here, a simple procedure like getting your wisdom teeth pulled doesn't go the way you want it to. So you have to get some painkillers. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but we hear that story far too often um, where, you know, people become addicts where they weren't even like, that's not the road I was even planning on. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So you, 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 you share it with her um, and then kind of go from there. Well, first of all, um, it was my idea to try it. <laughs> he it he he didn't make me do it. it it was my my choice to do it um from there we really just uh it we started with what was it it was just it was really just the purpose that at the time um mm. and um i guess the oxycontin when we could find the places because you know the prescription is going to run out eventually yeah um, and it, and it wasn't an all the time thing. It was just every now and then, um, I kind of had it in my head that, you know, maybe this could get picked up on a drug test. I might want to be careful. So yeah. it'd be more of, uh, kind of like a weekend thing for us. Our weekends are different than typical weekends with the shift work, but, uh, it was more of a once every once in a while. Yeah. 
and it just it ended up kind of taking over after a little while and progressing to a point to where we couldn't control that little once in a while and we needed it a lot more often. Yeah. And, with, and again, kind of the typical things that start to happen, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so at this time you're going through this, are you realizing like, Hey, we're going down a wrong road here, or were you still kind of maybe at least convincing yourself that everything's still okay? I think for the most part, we both were kind of convinced that we had um, control over it. I mean, and again, you know, we, we didn't grow up around drugs or right. you know, alcohol. So it, it wasn't like we had an example or had really seen what addiction can do, you know, to a person and family. Right. So we just kind of you know, thought we had it under control. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't seem like it was anything serious enough to worry about at the time. Um, you know, it hadn't quite felt the full fledged withdraw withdrawal from not having it. Like we'd wake up a day and not have it and, you know, we'd be tired, wouldn't we yeah. wouldn't feel right. And kind of associated that with some kind of withdrawal, but it didn't seem bad. So it was like, okay, yeah. you know, we control that. It's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, after a few years of that, that waking up, not feeling good turned a whole lot worse. Um, and right. then turned into something that we couldn't really control at all even though in our minds back then, we still kind of thought we could. Um, mm -hmm. We went a good eight years before realizing we actually had a, a real problem and asking for help. Eight years. Wow. Yeah. So how was your, and, and I, I want to ask this because how was your relationship with each other during this time? Were you guys, were you guys fighting? Were you getting along? Were you just, you know, isolating against each other? I mean, it's, I want, it would be interesting for our listeners to understand, like here you are being these parents, right? And, but at the same time, you guys are doing this together almost, it's almost like partners in crime kind of thing, but how yeah. was your relationship? Well, I mean, we, it, just like any other relationship, it had a, its ups and downs, but the downs were controlled by the substance. Mm. Um, you know, it, if on days that we couldn't make something happen and have something for us to feel better or not go into any kind of withdrawal, there were plenty of like arguments and mm -hmm. plenty of spats and get yeah. mad at kids for stuff that you really shouldn't get got mad at, you know, Yeah. And them seeing us argue times that they really probably shouldn't have seen it. Um, but you know, when we had things, everything's perfect. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and everybody felt great. So there wasn't <laughs> one reason to fight. Yeah. Did, did in that eight years, um, did you guys at all ever like during that time go, you know what, we need to stop doing this. Did you guys ever talk like that? To, or did you guys just kind of keep going down that road and, try to pretend everything was fine we, I mean, amongst yourselves, you know, I, we really didn't um, talk about it for the first mm. few years. And okay. we were, I think a, a big part of our problem was we were extremely, extremely successful at hiding it from our family and friends. So, yeah. you know, nobody ever knew that we did drugs until the very end, whenever we kind of lost control of things. So it, it really just seemed like a, a lifestyle. Like we, we didn't have to answer to anybody and nobody knew what we were doing. So it wasn't, a, I think we need to stop this, you know, for the first few years. Wow. Isn't that amazing that you can go that long and just, you think everything's okay. It's, it's unreal. Yeah. And you're going down this dark abyss that you don't even realize. And and like you said, you know, you start treating your kids differently, stuff you wouldn't normally get mad at. You're starting to get mad at, yep. you know, I, it's fascinating how our minds will trick us and say, Hey, no, you're good. Everything's fine. You're in yep. control. You know, you're still providing for the family. <laughs> you know, we got food on the table, that kind of thing. Yep. Um, did you guys graduate to harder drugs? Do you ever, did you ever go like, did it get way worse towards the end where you were doing like maybe heroin and things like that? Actually, that went at the at the very end is when it kind of went towards heroin. We progressed in uh, pain medication. Up, we actually progressed in that pretty quick up towards uh, Opana. Um, and we kind of stretched that out for the longest stint of our addiction. Um, mm -hmm. Until it got to where it couldn't really be found. It got where you couldn't afford it. And right. we had it on something cheaper and something that would work. So we turned pretty quickly to, uh, to heroin where we could find it um, and realize that that really wasn't comparing to the opana. Um, 
I, I don't really understand the, the science of it, but it, it didn't really seem to take care of the withdrawals like the panel would. Mm. Um, and you know, that, that only lasted probably a couple months before we found what we were un understanding as, uh, as fentanyl, you know, you, you can't really trust what a drug dealer's telling you. Right. But, uh, but they actually did tell us that that's what it was. And we were careful enough with it at first to, to try it out and realize that that was strong enough to kind of help our withdrawal, which was the worst way to turn yeah. because it just, it, it, it doubled, tripled, quadrupled, everything got worse very quick. Wow. We were, we were shooting. Yeah. We were actually, we had gone from um, crushing up pills and, you know, snorting them to um, wow. using fentanyl. Yeah. Yeah, using fentanyl and heroin through IV. Yeah, and you know, fentanyl is a such a I mean, it's all dangerous, but boy, that is another level of danger. Like you said, you never know what you're getting. Exactly. But isn't it fascinating how it started off with a simple Percocet? Yes. Just to just to make your jaw feel a little better. Right. And then it, you you realize, man, I sleep better. And it's interesting how you just start kind of justifying. You know, I, I, you know, I'm a counselor in a treatment center and we hear this a lot where we just start justifying the behavior in order for us to make feel us okay to keep doing it. Right. Yeah. And then here you are crushing pills, snorting pills, it leads to heroin, which leads to fentanyl and you're shooting it up yeah. and fentanyl, as you well know, is, I mean, so dangerous. I mean, did any of you, either one of you overdose at all, or do you guys ever go through that? Um, I actually did overdose um, once we had started doing just, like he said, what we understood to be just plain straight fentanyl. Um, mm. He actually. This is actually something we haven't told very often. Yeah, we actually haven't talked about this. Are you um, okay to talk about it? Yeah, yes. okay. yeah. I mean, it's, it's touchy, but there's no point in holding anything back because I mean, that's not going <laughs> to do anything to help anybody if you hold stuff back. Um, yeah. Well, if you're, if you're okay with sharing, we would, I think it would be good because again, I think there's someone that needs to hear this from you guys. Well, and it, you know, it was a, it, looking back, it, it makes me emotional, but, and I don't want to cut her off by telling the story, but you know, it, it, it wasn't any different of a day than any other day. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I, she was laying down with the kids when I first got home from work. I had picked up something on the way home because we always feel worse in the mornings. Right. And uh, kind of got it ready for us and went over to her, woke her up and kind of helped her do it. I went ahead and, yeah. uh, and, and used a needle for um, And then got a call from somebody that needed some help outside and stepped outside. Well, I stepped outside, never got a chance to do anything. And the whole time I'm helping somebody, something just doesn't feel right. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, after probably it, it feels like forever, but it was probably just a few minutes being outside and something not feeling right that I just, I, I just, I kind of stopped everything. I was like, hold, just hold on a second. I, I got to go inside for a second. And, uh, now I walked inside and, and saw her when, of course I saw her and her lips were blue. Oh, she, wow. uh, she, at that point she wasn't breathing. Hmm. Um, and I, Unfortunately, it's a gift and a curse, which I've told people plenty of times being in the, the occupation I am. I mean, I, I know how to handle things, but we didn't have Narcan. Right. Um, so bef before doing anything, calling 911, doing anything at all, I just immediately start breathing for her. Um, and it, it took, I don't know what my head was thinking about just doing that and that's it. But after about 30 seconds of that, she actually kind of came to a little bit. Mm hmm um, and again, looking back, you want to slap yourself in the face for, for things you did because I never called 911. Yeah. I never searched out some Narcan or anything like that. I just, I, I kind of stayed there the, the best I could and kind of helped her stay awake. Um, and, and, and shoot them. <laughs> that lasted hours, but, uh, yeah, it was just, it, it was scary. Wow. Yeah, I can only imagine what you were going through. And, and it's easy to always look back and go, hey, we should have done this. We should have done this. But but it really, in, in where you guys were at with your addiction, I mean, you don't think clearly. You don't act the way you should when you're in the height of your addiction. Right. And uh, 
But yeah, I bet that was a scary moment for you. And especially, I mean, even though you are a firefighter and you've seen probably things that, you know, would make our hair stand up, but to see your, see your beautiful wife laying there lifeless that's, blue, you know, I bet that was amazing. Just scary. Yeah. That's, that's definitely different. And you know, it's, it, it amazes you how, how your mind thinks at that time, because it's, you don't go into what you would normally do for somebody. Yeah. Um, and of course you're, addict mind is also telling you well, you're about to get in a whole lot of trouble yeah so it, it's you know fix the problem and keep anybody from finding the problem if possible kind of thing man yeah wow well so was this was this kind of maybe one of the catalysts that led to you guys going hey we need to get some help it wasn't far from that it wasn't and i and i think it was a a bigger turning point for him than it was for me um, mm. because I, I was convinced right up until, well, until we walked in the door at rehab that I didn't need to be there. Um, <laughs> but I think <laughs> him going through seeing me like that, um, I think that was kind of what planted the seed yeah. for yeah. him. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, I think that's what kind of okay. started it. So let's get to that point. So, you know, you guys are continually using at that point. What led to you finally, both of you going, okay, let's, I mean, again, you went to treatment together, which again is very rare. <laughs> I mean, I've been, I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't think I've ever seen it. <laughs> um, so that's an interesting story in itself, but you guys decide to go get help together at the same rehab. Is that correct? Yes. So what led up to you finally going, okay, let's do this. Well, it, I don't like to put it this way, but we ran out of options on getting things. Mm. Uh, we, I had spent everything I could spend. Um, at, by that time, we were living with my parents. Uh, okay. the, the house wasn't gone yet, but it was, it was vacant. Mm. Um, by that time, the, the truck was gone. Uh, it, it just, you know, I, I pawned everything I could. I'd sold everything I could. I wasn't much of a thief, but I did when I did what I had to. Yeah, <laughs> what sure. I, what, I, what I thought I had to, yeah. um, including things from work. Um, mm. And and that that kind of got to me pretty bad. And, and finally, I mean, we had talked about needing some help before, but it, it got serious enough to where it was like, look, there's no turning point. Like, we, we have to make a decision. Um and crazy enough, it, it was either the same day or the day after where I was laying in bed, obviously trying to figure out what we're going to do about not being sick and what we're going to do about making a decision. And uh, I got a, a random phone call from her father, mm. um, which I was not crazy about answering. <laughs> yeah um, right <laughs> i mean not not i mean I, I wasn't feeling good already i mean yeah. it was bedtime i just wanted to lay down figure out what was going to happen and it, when when he wants to talk to you he didn't stop <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna track you down oh yeah my phone rang five or six times probably seven or eight text messages and finally he called the house phone which like i said would live with my parents yeah i get a knock on the door and uh he's like and it was my my dad and he's like I don't know what's going on, but Dean needs to talk to you right now. Mm -hmm. so, okay, fine. I, I can't get out of this now, I guess. Yeah. You know, I, I got on the phone and kind of to make, make this longer story a little bit shorter. Um, he asked me if I was around anybody. I, I told him just, you know, the family, as far as me and her and the boys. Right. Yeah. Um, he asked if anybody could hear me. I said, no. This actually tears me up worse than anything. <laughs> But uh, yeah, he had a way of uh, using sayings for just about everything. And he, he said, Roger, I know something's up. I know something's going on. I'm going to ask you once and once only. And you can either say yes, and I can get some help. Or you can say no, and I'll leave you alone forever. Mm. But, but don't piss on my boots and tell me it's raining. You're right. <laughs> and of course, you know, it's just the way he was. He was going to say something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, he, he was like, what's going on? I know something's wrong. Do you need help? And he's like, all I wanted was 
one word. Yeah. And that's, and that's all I gave him. I just said, yes. Wow. And, uh, wow. He, he said, that's fine. Don't say anything else. I'll make some calls in the morning. If it involves her too, we'll handle it as we go. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. And I went from there. Wow. What a phone call. Yeah. My gosh, you're choking me up. Um, Cause obviously he was sensing that something was obviously off with you and with his daughter. And, yeah. but, but, you know, God, I'm trying not to cry myself. Um, I mean, what I look at that, or that call was like, it's like one of those tender mercies from the universe or God, or like, I mean, as hard as it was to hear him on that other line, on the yeah. other side of that phone. Um, but what a gift for, for you and for, for you, Ashley, as well, like to be able to have someone call you out like that. Yeah, he was, uh, he was big on calling people out and, uh, <laughs> he, um, he just, I, I didn't actually hear the conversation, but of course, as soon as they got off the phone, you know, Roger told me what they said, what he had mm -hmm. said and, you know, he, him saying that it doesn't matter what you, what you tell me, um, yeah. I'm still going to love both of you just kind of yeah. solidified, you know, that we needed to tell him the truth. We needed to come out with it because yeah. he was giving us a, he was handing it to us. Wow. That is, I'm so glad you shared that. Thank you so much. I, you know, for those who are listening and you have a loved one that you know that is struggling, this is proof of why we need to get uncomfortable and make the phone call, track him down. <laughs> like, like you said, Roger, he wasn't going to give up until he got a hold of you. <laughs> and, and, and if your, if your family wouldn't answer the phone, I'm sure he probably would have just went over there. Uh, it, it, it was an hour drive and I can promise you he would on, he would knock on the door. <laughs> <laughs> so so you hear this, yes, and then he's gonna he's gonna maybe open some doors and help you, you know, go down that path of getting some help. Is you know, is that when you guys decided, hey, let's 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 do this together and let's let's get our lives back? It 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 really was the 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 decision day or the decision making couple of days. Um, we uh, I, we don't give a, a, enough credit to the place we went, which I don't necessarily want to say that out loud because I don't want every couple calling there thinking it's just okay for couples. Um, yeah. Because that was the first thing we were told that it's not. Um, that we were we we called after call after call asking, you know, it, no matter what we wanted to do, we weren't going to do it unless we did it together. Yeah. Well, um, real quick, Roger, I don't mean to cut you off, but you're you. Like I work at a treatment center as well. We won't, we won't, we won't, we won't let that happen. We yeah. always say, Nope, can't do it. And, and so that's pretty, I think that's the norm. So for you guys to find a place and again, and I understand why you don't want to mention their name, but uh, I guess props to them that they gave it, gave it a shot. Cause usually it doesn't work very well. <laughs> well, it, I don't you know, think my they, daddy. they weren't, they weren't really okay with it by any means, <laughs> but, uh, we had somebody on our side that wasn't going to take a no for an answer. I don't think my, I don't think my daddy was going to let them say no. So that's, and, so yeah, thanks to him. He made it happen. He really, he played a huge part in that. He did. Uh, wow. You know, wow. I don't think we would have gotten in together if he hadn't have been involved because so, he, he asked me if it was a deal breaker and as selfish and silly as it sounds, you know, he said, is it a deal breaker if you can't go together? And I said, yes. I said, we, we want to go together. We started it together. We want to finish it together. Wow. And he took it from there. See, that's what's so cool about your guys' story though, is yeah. Like you just said it perfectly. You started this together. We're going to finish this together. And I, and again, you know, I'm looking at a picture right now on your Instagram, Ashley, and you've listed, um, what is it? 13 things, 13 years of marriage is like, you know, a tapestry and you, you know, you list some things off. And I mean, you know, the first time Roger told, told you uh, that he loves you was at station nine. Right. Um, and you know, everyone thought you guys were crazy that you'd get, you know, married and engaged after only 11 months of dating. 
And I yeah. laughed at that. I, I, I got to tell you guys this. I laughed at that because I dated my wife for a month and a half before we got engaged. <laughs> when you know, you know. When you know, you know. I've been married to her for 29 years. We got four kids. Uh, <laughs> and, it, and people thought we were nuts. They're like, are you yeah. kidding me? What are you imagine. doing? <laughs> you know, but I love what you said. You guys obviously are so much in love. You guys are so connected. I mean, I wish people right now could see you. You guys are sitting on your bed together. I think it's a bed. I don't know. <laughs> and and they got their arms around each other. And it's just beautiful to watch you guys share this story together. Um, I So I appreciate that. So so when you guys decide they agree, they let you go into treatment. Was that was that November 18th? Is that the day you considered your sobriety date? November 18th, it, it was, uh, yeah, that evening is when we checked in. Okay. Um, we just kind of used that date because that was the date we checked in. That, that sure. was the most memorable date. Yeah. Well, and um, which was beautiful. And what was cool, um, I mean, again, I, I mean, I don't mean to bring up these raw emotions, but your dad passed away, Ashley, and your father-in-law in, uh, in 2020. And what was great though, is you guys got cleaned up and on the right path before he passed. Yeah. 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 And again, my heart goes out to you. I'm sorry that he's passed. And, uh, did when he did pass away, was it, uh, I know it's a difficult time, but did it cause you guys to think of maybe relapsing? Cause I know sometimes people will relapse when they have a, you know, they lose someone close to them like that. Did that ever cross your guys's mind or, or were you guys like, no, we're going to stay the course? Um, it was it was the opposite of relapse. Um, okay. In fact, I, I had someone come up to me at the funeral after we had just buried him and um, expressed that they were concerned, you know, that yeah. I may turn back. And I, I was I was a little bit of a bitch, understandably. <laughs> but um, I said something like, um, I can't really think of a, of a worse way to disrespect Ooh. my father's memory than to start Ooh. using again. Wow. Um, and, and I meant that because that would be a complete, not only would that be a complete fail for us, but he, he made that happen for us. Yeah. And I, I won't, there was no, yeah relapse or or i don't even think we talked about it it was just a yeah it was it was there was, it wasn't there wow well i love that too what you just said i i think you know i work with a lot of people who have lost loved ones through overdose and 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 i i work through where i always say if your loved one was standing right in front of you right now would they want you to blow up your life would they want you to be sad and they're like absolutely not and i'm like then let's honor them by giving them what they want. And I, that's exactly what you're saying is like, we would not disrespect him like that. So we're going to honor him by continually what we're doing and stay the course. And, right. and honestly, this is a part of it. And I feel like I feel grateful that I get to be a part of hearing your story here. And we're going to get this out to so many people. And what another great way to honor your father, your father-in-law, Roger, in this way to, Cause your story is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Just love it. Um, what, what were, you know, and there's so many questions I have and we can go in so many different directions here, but I, what were, what was the biggest lesson? And I know this is a loaded question and I want to hear from both of you. What was the biggest lesson you learned in your rehab uh, stay? Like what, what was the one thing that just, okay, you know what, I've got this or you had an aha moment. Can you, can you share maybe one or two things that you guys maybe took away from that? For it. <laughs> uh, well, like we had said earlier, um, the entire way to rehab, um, I was convinced that we didn't need to be there. And I, I, I told my daddy that, and um, he was like, well, I'm not paying unless you stay the whole time type thing because we okay. just had that kind of relationship but I even when I walked through those doors I was still fully convinced that we didn't need to be there that we were better than everybody there and that 
we could have handled it without going. Right. Um, but I got a huge slap in the face. Um, and I really go in, into detail um, on my blog about this. But yeah. the, the morning after our first night there, um, we hadn't seen each other since we had went to bed. And I had an assessment that I had to go to first thing that morning with, you know, doctors. And oh, all yeah. Kind of yep. <laughs> and as soon as I sat down, I was like, how's, how's my husband? How's Roger? And the only way I can describe it is the nurse was like, he's fine. But the way she said it made like the hair on the back of my neck stand <laughs> up. And it was just like, okay, something's wrong. Something's, mm. something's wrong. So I basically bullshitted my way through their question. <laughs> And told them what they wanted to hear so I could get out of there. Yeah. Um, and I, I took off down the hallway and I bumped into somebody. And when I looked up, I realized it was him. <laughs> um, but he didn't recognize me. Um, mm. And I hit, it's, this was like my, my, oh my, oh my God moment. Um, yeah. He was, he was wearing scrubs. Um he had a sweater on and it was hanging off one of his shoulders. He didn't, he didn't have shoes on. He just had socks on. Mm. Um, and he, there was no recognition in his eyes when he looked down at me and wow. it, um, wow. That was when I guess you could say the, the rose colored glasses came off because I, I realized yeah. what, how broken we really were yeah. by seeing him like that. And it, it crushed me. like it, it really did. Um, and, you know, after that, I realized this is exactly where we need to be. We're not better than anybody here. You know, if anything, we're worse. I mean, we, I was angry at myself for thinking, you know, that yeah. we didn't need it. And I had to yeah. deal with a lot of just being mad at myself. I guess, yeah. but that was, that was probably the, the biggest turning point for me there as far as realizing that I, I did need to be there. Yeah. Another, uh, as hard as that was, what another, what another tender mercy, if you want to call it that from God or, you know, whatever you believe in, um, that it woke you up, you it know? Did. Yeah. How about you, Roger? Was there something in rehab that just hit you that you're like, okay, I'm ready to, to move on from this addiction? One of them definitely was that night. <laughs> okay. I, uh, yeah. That, that night was, was pretty rough for me. Um, you know, we, we thought we had experienced withdrawals before, but we had no idea. Right. Uh, when, when it actually started, which was for me, it was a good 12 to 14 hours before her. Um, you know, that the, the pain that was there and yeah, I, I'm pretty sure the reason I was the way I was with her when she saw me was, you know, they had probably given me everything they knew to give me to try yeah. and help things probably three or four times. Cool. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I, I was completely out of it, but nothing, yeah. helped, nothing helped at all. Um, and you know, I, and I don't want to sound too cheesy, which I'm sure we already do sound cheesy enough. <laughs> no. But I, like, I, I can remember laying, laying in bed and, you know, I, I'm extremely protective, like just, just very protective over her and the boys and my little girl now. Um, but I can remember laying in bed and wanting to know how she was, but not being able to get up and, and something in my mind keeping me from even trying to get up because I, I was just, I felt so bad. And I, I just, I don't want to ever experience that again, because I, I tell everybody she's, I, I put her first in everything. Yeah. And at that time she couldn't be. And it, that, that hit me really hard. Yeah. Um, wow. And, you know, and to, to get away from the sappy stuff a little bit, you know, it, a big, another big part for me was a lot of the friends we made in there. Um, we, yeah. we, we got to hear a lot of, you know, backstories from people's lives and what put them there and yeah you know and realize that we're not alone you know it, it's it's not when people think of drug addicts it's, it's not a typical drug addict right you know, it's, it, 
there's all kinds of people in there, doctors, lawyers, firemen, nurses. I mean, yep. all kinds of people. Yeah. And that really helped me a lot. Wow. Yeah. It's that's, I mean, I'm just, you guys are really painting a picture and I was imagining you guys running into that, in that hallway and just looking at each other going, look at us. We're, we're a mess, you know, and a fentanyl heroin withdrawal is no joke. Um, and that's why people usually keep relapsing because they don't want to go through the withdrawals. Cause it, like you were saying, Roger, it is brutal. Yeah. It is not, uh, it, and, but I also say this, if you guys can do that, you can do anything, <laughs> you know, right. That's right. Yeah, that's, yeah. We say it all the time. That was well, yeah. And I love, you know, I love now that you guys, I mean, you congratulations on having over three years of uh, being clean and sober. So congrats to you guys. I mean, your story is amazing. I love what you said, Ashley. Hey, we started this together. We're going to finish it together. And not only that, you're now giving back, you know, um, Ashley, you have a blog. Um, Her right to reign is what you call it. Is that correct? Yes. Making sure I'm saying that right. And, and it's one of the, your ways to give back. You, you, you write. It's therapeutic for you. I know you guys have a desire to help those that are going through the same thing that you've been through. And again, that's why we're on this podcast together today um, to hear your amazing story, because we want to reach people who maybe there's a couple out there right now that is going through what you're going through, but they're not sure how to or what to do. And they're going to be inspired by what you guys said. And they're like, you know what, let's go get some help. Let's go do this. And 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 again, you guys are honoring, you know, your dad and your father in law today uh, by sharing this. So thank you for for being willing to do this for us today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Oh, absolutely. So Ashley, I know you've got a, uh, you, this blog, you got some other things you're working on. Why don't you share with us what you're doing? And if someone wants to reach out to you guys or to, you know, see some of your writings and, and the things you're people you're collaborating with, what's the best way for them to do that? Well, my, my actual website that my personal website, my blog um, is, is just that it's, it's a personal website with, writings about my family um okay. i'm writing about our journey in rehab right now in extreme detail um just to kind of share that portion of our journey okay. and then of course i've got stuff about my daddy and you know just mm. funny stuff like that okay. um but yeah um i also have a second website that we'll be launching um hopefully within the next week or so. Okay. Um, and it's called um, Recover and Rain. And Rain is spelled the same way, R-E-I-G-N. And that is going to be more of a, uh, a co like a coaching website where people can oh. contact me because I have awesome. a lot of people message me and yeah. it's hard to keep up with. Um, <laughs> So I've just kind of yeah. created something separate from gotcha. the actual personal blog. Okay. Um, and also I am collaborating with um, the Sober app. It hasn't launched yet, but it is supposed to launch mid-January. And we're really excited about it. Um, I'm the only person that offers, I guess, the service and the experience yeah. that they have on that app as far as couples and and yeah. to spouses and stuff like that so mm -hmm. i'm i'm super excited about that i love it that's so cool uh that's gonna be great so the new website's uh recovery and is and spelled out a n d yeah it's um recover it's just recover and oh, recover okay. yeah recover and rain dot com is that correct mm -hmm. all right and then your and your personal website is her right to rain dot com yes yeah. Love it. Um, anything else that you guys would want to wrap up with? I, I do have one more question that I'd like to ask both of you, if that's okay. okay. Um, so I kind of just painted you in a corner there. You got anything else to say? And then I'm like, no, I got the question. I'm sorry about that. But uh, if there's someone listening to your story right now and they are in a dark place, um, they don't know what to do. They're struggling. You've already given great advice already. But what's, what could you say to that one person right now? Just a simple thing that you could tell them right now that would help them um, in this dark place that they might find themselves in. What would you say? Um, 
I would probably tell them that it's not too late. Um, it's never too late until it's too late. And I, and yeah. I know that sounds extremely cliche, but um, no yeah. matter how bad you think your situation is, um, it, it can be fixed. And it yeah. doesn't have to be in the traditional you know, way that recovery happens. Like you can create your own recovery plan program and style you know if you're afraid to go to na or aa you don't have to do that to recover you you do what works for you Mm. and like there's no there's no right or wrong way to do it as long as you're making an attempt and you're trying to stay clean and sober i think you're doing the right thing and i that that's my message i think people need to realize that you don't have to follow the crowd to get better. You know, you can, yeah. you can forge your own path. Yeah. You can go to rehab together. I mean, come on. How about you, Roger, if you could say one thing to someone out there who's listening, that's having a hard time. Well, I could easily repeat everything she said, because that was a big deal for us. Um, just, we, we recovered our own way. Um, but uh, another big thing for me was, you know, it, you're not alone. Um, mm-hmm. it, yeah, there, there's a lot of people that are willing to help if you just ask for it. Uh, it. It's really hard to step up and ask that question, to ask for help. But once you do it, you realize that there's a lot of help out there. Yeah. yeah. It was extremely embarrassing for me. I was worried about work. I was worried about what, what people think, what my parents thought, what her parents thought. But once we actually, I actually asked for help, it was over. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. Yeah. Well, Great. you know, and I know you guys say this a lot. If you want it bad enough, anything is possible, yeah. you know? And, and I, I look at that as, as your dad, that was obviously his mentality. He's like, no, I, I watch me. I'll get these guys help. I will, I will track them down. You know, I will make sure I drive them there. I want to make this happen. I love that mentality. And really we need that a lot of times in addiction because we have to, we have to really want it. And obviously you guys got to that point eventually. And it's so great to see you guys, honestly, and, and see you smiling faces. And, and I love what you guys are trying to do to help other people. And I don't know, I just feel honored that I had the opportunity to, to meet you guys and, I can't wait for our listeners to hear your story. Thank you. We appreciate you having us. You betcha. Well, there you go, folks. I told you this was going to be one of those things that you would love to hear. Um, If you have a son or a daughter or, um, you know, a niece or a nephew or anyone or a friend who is struggling, please share this episode with them. Please reach out to them. I always say this, if you struggle talking to someone that you know is having a hard time and you maybe think they're addicted to something, send them this episode and it'll break the ice and you can always follow up and say, hey, I want to talk to you. Hopefully you listen to that episode. But um, yeah, uh, Roger and Ashley, you guys are amazing people and we're lucky to have you and and we're lucky to have you in this world and keep being a light to others and, and to all the best of luck that you're doing. So thank you. Thank Thank you you so much. All right. Love you guys. Until next time. Take care.